So hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today. It is your weekly space hangout for Friday, May 3rd, 2013. And we have so many stories today. Again, we've got uh, the biggest, uh, sorry, the brightest gamma ray burst ever, the Test the Virgin Galactic spacecraft, a cool storm on Saturn, uh, collisions of galaxies spotted by Chandra, uh, maybe a test of the X-51, an upcoming solar eclipse, and more and more and more. So we're going to get to uh, get cracking. You can meet everybody who is uh, joining us this week, and we've assembled an enormous team to talk about an enormous number of stories. So let's just get through it. So we've got Alan Boyle from Cosmic Log. Greetings. Awesome. We've got Amy Shira Title. Hello. From Vintage Space and other places. We've got a new person joining us this week, which is David Dickinson. Hey there. David. David has written, uh, you're at Astro Guys and also has done some writing for, uh, for Universe Today. So awesome. We've got Jason Major. Space. Space. Mm -hmm. We've got Dr. Matthew Francis. Oh, he's muted. Still muted. There we go. There we go. Two places to mute. <laughs> I know, I know. And we've got Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Hello. Who is going to be producing this show and posting lots of cool pictures of uh, of all of the uh, of the stories, posting up the the story links and pictures as we as we come across them. So all the clicking. All right. Um, and Alan, I kicked a story your way. Is that fine? X fifty one. You want to talk sure. about that? Sure. All right. Okay. You want to start with that? No. No. Oh. No. Oh. No. All I right. just want to make right. sure that you're okay to do that. <laughs> if not, that you can prepare yourself mentally and emotionally. For, I'm ready. For that. Okay. <laughs> and emotionally. No. I think the first story we'll talk about is this really bright gamma ray burst, the brightest one ever. Doctor Francis. All right. Well, one moment. Let me bring up. I, the I can graphic. do that while you talk. Okay. Well, that works. Too. While you talk. You only All have right. to think and talk. Yes. You don't have to also click and share. All right. Well, I will take it away then. All right. So this is the brightest gamma ray burst yet seen, and it's also the uh, not not uh, coincidentally the longest duration gamma burst yet seen. So gamma ray bursts are, uh, to our best knowledge, the explosion of very very massive stars. So not just a supernova, but a a big hypernova. So uh, so this was spotted on April 27th. Uh, by the way, gamma ray bursts always have these really kind of a license plate name. So this one is, I even had to write it down, GRB130427A. And that was found it's on April... Date. You're right. Huh, you're, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Huh, so it was the first one slain on that day. You know, I never made that connection really? before. Oh, okay. Theorist, theorist, theorist. <laughs> okay, but anyway, it was the longest. And it, it, But what's interesting, though, of course, is because it's so bright, that means it's relatively close by, um, relatively in cosmic terms. It's about uh, 3.6 billion light years away. But a lot of gamma ray bursts are a lot farther away. So this one is very interesting because it was long enough that... They, that uh, it could be observed both uh, by the orbiting um, uh, Fermi satellite, gamma ray satellite, but it could also be observed, follow-up observations by ground-based telescopes at the same time, which almost never happens. Usually gamma ray bursts flash and then fade, and then you ha kind of have to work backward and track them down. But this one actually uh, was successfully spotted, and so... Um, very exciting stuff means there's going to be a ton of data from it. Um, great, great thing, and it's one of those. Oh, can I? Uh, one of those. Oh my God, type. Uh, um, I'll I'll clean up what I was going to originally say. Uh, oh my Oh my God, moments really, really bright and awesome. What was now, the uh, What was the visual magnitude on that? I could not find optical data on it. Okay. Okay. Um, I will see if I can track that down, and then we can add it later. But I, I couldn't. The, the press release just came out today, yeah. and it doesn't link to a paper. So, and there's nothing on the archive about it. So I'm going to see if I can find a visual magnitude because I wanted to know that answer. What about an astronomer's too. telegram that might have it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll check. Daniel Fisher, Cosmos for You, has been tweeting about this for days. So uh, I, I okay. think he links he links to a couple of the telegrams. So I, I'm okay. wondering if any amateurs might have caught it, you know, just on their random exposures. 
Well, there was one awful. other gamma ray burst that hit visual, like naked eye visual magnitude yeah. a few yeah. years yeah. back. Yeah. So I it's not impossible. Yeah. Now, now, you know, I mean, if I understand correctly, right, gamma ray bursts, the cause is essentially really large stars going kaboom, or, you know, compact objects colliding with one another. So, right. you know, was there anything special, or was it just a really extra big star that went kaboom? It's just that it was extra big and extra long. So the fact that you that we've got more data from this than before, um, I'm not sure why it's just hitting now uh, since it happened on April 27th. Why it's just hitting NASA uh, press releases now, but uh, uh, well, I mean, a lot of the times this raw data is totally available, but yeah. it takes sort of a certain mindset. Someone's got to be actually looking through it and trying to get a sense of it. But you know, if if it finally makes it through NASA's you know, press release, then they're going to take it and they're going to write it up and then we all start reporting on it because, you know, we weren't looking through the raw right. logs from, you know, from the space telescopes, which maybe we should. I don't know. Although, actually, if I, I, if I can pick up on something that, that Fraser said, um, we can definitely rule out the possibility that this was another, another source of gamma ray bursts is two neutron stars colliding, two pulsars colliding. And uh, the reason we can rule that out in this case is because the, the duration of the explosion was too long. Gamma ray bursts that come from, from collisions are short duration. Um, and this was not that. So we can rule that out. Fantastic. And they, they uh, expect to find, um, they expect to be able to see the supernova remnant that, uh, supernova of that caused it within a month. Yes. Which would be awesome. And I, and I think if you want to get a sense of the scale of like how much damage is getting done by a, a gamma ray burst, uh, you should definitely pick up uh, Phil Plate's book, Death from the Skies. He's got a great oh. chapter just on gamma ray bursts, how you get essentially this horrible beam of energy that goes That's halfway across here. a galaxy. There we go. And, awesome and strips away your atmosphere in a heartbeat. So, uh, yeah, no, a gamma ray burst, even if you're a whole half galaxy away, it is no protection from something this powerful. So amazing. All right, well, let's move on. We get so many stories. Um, so Virgin Galactic did their first power, their power test, and they broke the speed of sound. Amy? Yeah, uh, that happened on Monday. Um, so the Spaceship 2 is launched underneath a mothership. It's not actually launched on a rocket like we're sort of used to seeing in spaceflight. So, um, the mothership is flying, it drops the, the spaceship too, and, and on Monday it ignited its engine and actually went supersonic. I don't actually, off the top of my head, know how fast it went. If anybody has that link, they could tell it off. Um, but it did go supersonic for about uh, 16 seconds, I think, before its engine shut out, and then it, it came down for a landing. So that's a huge milestone, because of course when Spaceship 2 does eventually um, launch from a mothership and do the same trajectory to get into orbit, it's going to have to do that supersonically, so that it actually went supersonic on Monday is it's pretty a big milestone. Um, so that's fun. <laughs> now, Alan, were you there when they did the first test for Spaceship One? Did you actually see it yeah. get tested? Yeah, yeah, three for uh, all three flights. Yeah, June and then two kind of in the September-October time frame. Yeah. But I, you know, there wasn't a lot of advance notice that this was going to happen. It was, it was pretty quiet, and then they did their test. I saw some rumors and sort of conversation that was going to happen, but they definitely didn't make a big to-do about it this time around. No, uh, actually they made more of a to-do about it this time around than they would have under the under Bert Rutan's uh, tenure because Bert was al always, you know, he didn't want to make, he, he wanted to make sure that it really worked uh, and so he didn't want have to have all these journalists breathing down his neck as uh, as they do this stuff. So uh, this this time there was a little bit advance notice, but there's always a chance that they could call off the test. And even if a pilot sees that something doesn't look right uh, before they do the drop, they don't have to light up the engine. They can just glide back down to a landing. So uh, you know they they want to give themselves as much leeway as possible. Um, and so it's, when, you know, where are we on the, on the timeline now compared to actually paying passengers getting a chance to fly in space? Oh, uh, well, they're going to do a series of tests. This was the first test they'll do. They'll kind of build up to actually putting the test pilots above the 100-kilometer altitude mark, and that will be officially they're in space. But 
that will they expect that that will happen by the end of the year, but it's going to take a little while longer for commercial operations to start up, and they expect that commercial operations will be in a different place at uh, the Spaceport America space, uh, uh, facility in New Mexico. So uh, now they're saying that it's going to be early next year that Richard Branson and his family are going to climb aboard and, and be on that first commercial flight, but a lot of people have told me that it, it it could take longer than that. It could be, uh, you know, even way back when uh, some people were betting it was going to be 2015, other people were betting it was going to be 2017. So uh, it's nice to be optimistic, but uh, also to be realistic and don't expect, you know, don't don't set aside your vacation time yet for next year. I heard they've also raised the price, right? Like I think it was before it was two hundred thousand for a trip, and now I've heard they've raised it to two hundred fifty. Yeah. yeah, they're saying that it's likely that they will raise the price to two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a seat, and and that may be sort of a marketing thing so that you get people interested in kind of getting the two hundred thousand deal. Uh, but eventually, uh, everyone at Virgin Galactic has talked about how the price should eventually come down to about the price of an SUV or a very expensive vacation on Earth. So this is really kind of more of a, a marketing, let's, ra let's, let's talk about a price raise. Maybe they will raise the price for a while and then see how the market goes once well, you've got the early adopters flown. So I, just a show of hands here, who, who would fly on Virgin Galactic? Yeah, you bet. Will you give me two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the ticket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's free the ticket, assumption. Yeah, free sure. ticket. It's gotta free be ticket. Longer, um, so I, I was just uh, noted on on Facebook that um, the Ver spaceship two hit a top speed of twenty five hundred miles per hour. Yeah, according to test. Robert Herrick on YouTube, uh, hit, they hit Mach one point two. Oh, nice. Oh right! I forgot to mention that people can comment and 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 uh, <clears throat> and give us updates and and answer our questions as well. So if you're watching this uh, on Google Plus in the event page, you can post your comments there. If you're watching this somewhere in the streams, uh, you can. I don't know if you got that one, Nicole, the one from your from your yep. feed. Okay, yep. yeah. Oh, I don't know if I shared it, but I have it. Yeah, um, you can get it from Share. from if it's Nicole's stream, you can post a comment there. Uh, if you're watching this just somewhere embedded, you can use the hashtag. What are we using? Space Hangout. Space, space Hangout. Okay, use the hashtag Space Hangout. Or uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, which is kind of the safest place to to uh, to sort of comment and make sure your comments get seen, uh, you can post a comment there just on YouTube. Just click Watch on YouTube, and then there will be lots of comments there. As we go, I'll be posting links on the comments of the event page, but I'll also include them in the description of the YouTube video when we're done. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so now this this is cool. This this picture me was all the rage this uh, this week, and I know Jason, you uh, report on this. This amazing storm on Saturn. Yeah, this is this is some really really neat stuff. Um, well, but let me lead up to it before. before I'm sure Nicole's digging the pictures up the picture as we talk. So, um, do you want me to hold off on the picture? Do you want it to be a reveal? Well, hold off on the picture. Hold all off right. on. It. Get it ready. Get it ready. So, well, you know, Saturn is. Saturn is a very windy planet. Okay, uh, it's a it's a gas giant. There's no there's no uh, solid surface. There's no liquid oceans uh, under there. There's nothing that's going to uh, affect the wind um, from from a ground standpoint. And it has a lot of uh, internal heat that's powering these 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 powerful winds. Um, and then the storms themselves, the eddies, the shears between the uh, the jet streams, these you know the big bands that, that go up and down the latitudes of the planet, those power the winds as well. So basically, everything is blowing around on Saturn all the time, permanently. Well, right at the top, right at the right over the North Pole, there's a 1,200 mile wide hurricane, this huge cyclone that's just churning and churning away up there. You know, uh, uh, clouds get caught up in it. Smaller storms start spinning around in it. And basically, it's like this big vortex that dips down into the, uh, the cloud bands, into the atmosphere on Saturn. And last November, Cassini managed to get a shot of that as its new trajectory kind of took it up out of the ring plane and, and around the poles of Saturn. So as the sunlight's hitting the northern hemisphere, it's lighting all that stuff up, uh, charging up the storms with a little extra solar energy and 
the photos that came back, I, in fact, I remember when that photo came back because I just happened to be up looking at the Cassini stream that day and these new raw images came in and it, I mean, literally knocked me out of my chair. I mean, it was just, I had to write a post about it. That was, that was in November. So just this week, NASA put out some recolored images of the same exact shots that came out in November. Uh, Nicole, yeah, there it is. And so if you pop that up there, you can see the storm, this, this huge hurricane, and, and this thing spinning um, right over Saturn's North Pole. What we're looking at here is the, the red clouds. Now, keep in mind, this isn't true color. So the storm isn't really this blood red color, like something out of some you know, H.P. Lovecraft novel. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, in reality, the Saturn storms are, are much more tan, and uh, up in the northern hemisphere are some, some icy blues and greens. Um, so, but, but what this color does do is it lets us see a lot of the, um, a lot of the, uh, contrast in the cloud formations. And we're looking into something that's diving deep into Saturn's atmosphere. The clouds are at a lower level than the, the red clouds are at a lower level than the green clouds outside of them. So, you know, they're, they're further down. And of course, the deeper red you go, the more you're looking down into Saturn's polar atmosphere. So it, it's amazing how how much there is that almost like an elevation change. Like you're really looking down. Yes. Down into these clouds, and the, I mean, and the clouds like a, are the, whirling. It's like a. It's like a Grand Canyon. Yeah. Like a, into you know it, yeah. seen at sunset. Um. So it's just you know it's just beautiful. So this was this image just basically knocked everybody's socks off this week. You know, almost the same way as at first, as they first did when they came out in, at the end of November. But these recolorized versions, they've been cleaned up a little bit. You know, had some of the hot pixels removed and stuff like that. So um, um, the the impact of it is just amazing, and it just shows us the the type of uh, incredible uh, atmosphere that we're seeing on Saturn. You know, um, I don't love the forget scale. That, like Jupiter, it has storms too, and and it's it's really, really exciting stuff, and we can only see these in, these images because Cassini is on its uh, its new trajectory that's up and over the poles. So that's that's fantastic, and you know now that it's approaching summertime on Saturn, the poles are getting more light, so we can see these things. I love the scales of the turret. Like you have this little guy here, which mimics yeah. the larger storm. All these different scales uh, of the turbulence. Cool. Now keep in mind, keep in mind that storm up there. Um, you know side to side, it's about 1,200 miles. So that storm itself um, is basically almost, you know, halfway across the United States. It's a big storm. That's a giant hurricane. Yeah. Cool. I've got one question. Uh, Rod Mole wants to know what speed are those clouds moving? I don't know if anyone knows. The, the entire storm structure is moving uh, around Saturn's North Pole around 300, a little over 300. 300 miles an hour. Wow. Now, 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 that's actually slow compared to other wind speeds on Saturn. Uh, around the equator, you're looking at 1,000, 1,100 miles an hour uh, that those that those wind belts are going. So that's actually kind of kind of pokey for Saturn, but still, it's a really, really powerful storm here on Earth. It would be like a Category Eight storm on yeah. Earth, I, I think. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> Um, okay, cool. So now, Nicole, we're going to ask you to uh, walk and chew gum at the same time here sure. and present a story about a, a galaxy collision as seen by Chandra. Absolutely, I can do that. Uh, so Chandra X-ray Observatory is the the flagship X-ray telescope, space telescope that that uh, is a project of uh, NASA. And one thing that X-rays give that you can see in X-rays really well is hot gas, really, really hot gas. Now, when you look at a galaxy, you think, okay, the galaxy is made of all these stars and stuff, and we know there's a lot of dark matter in there as well. But actually, when you've got galaxies in a cluster, the stuff that makes up the most mass of normal matter, not including dark matter, is this hot X-ray gas. And so what we see here in this image that I'm going to screen share while I talk and chew gum at the same time. Actually, I thought I about got it. chewing gum. Oh, oh thank you. It. Excellent. Thank you, Matthew. Because <laughs> uh, I can so... even write about it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is a, a composite image of, uh, so the purple is the X-ray gas from Chandra. And so this, this is 7 million degree gas, really hot gas. And this is, uh, of going around these galaxies, these two spiral galaxies that have collided. And I'm not sure where the optical data was taken from. Uh, I should be able to find that at some point. But that was uh, taken 
Um, so that's what these two galaxies are colliding here, two spiral galaxies. Now what we think happens is when two spiral galaxies like that collide, uh, first of all, the stars don't collide, but the gas does. And when the gas collides, it makes more stars. So it's undergoing an intense period of star formation. That is throwing up all kinds of gas out into this massive halo. And what we think this will eventually turn into is an elliptical galaxy. And so the, the thinking as it goes is that as galaxies merge together, they make larger and larger galaxy. And uh, so this will end up looking like a, an elliptical kind of football-shaped galaxy. Uh, another thing they found in the gas is the types of elements that they saw in the gas tell you that there are a lot of supernova going on at this time, particularly core collapse supernova. That means massive stars go boom at the end of their very short lives. And that is what's uh, populating and filling this cool X-ray gas. So it's a gorgeous image showing the violence of, uh, of a galaxy um, of a galaxy merger, both in optical and the fallout in X-ray, which is pretty cool. Yeah, just a stunning image. Yes. Um, oh, okay. So you just so we just muted David, but uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, he's it's okay. Back we're gonna get noise. back. We're gonna talk to David in a second here. So uh, now, David, you just warned people to watch for the sky falling on Universe Today. So uh, well, it, it depends which one. You're talking about the Edda. Aquarid meteor. Yeah, Aquarids, yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're going to have a pretty good meteor shower uh, coming this weekend. The peak is going to fall on Monday on May 6th. Uh, Eastern Europe and longitudes east of that are going to see a better meteor shower. But I've been watching every morning uh, when it's clear anyway, which isn't very often here in May in Florida. But the zenithal hourly rate's pretty good on this meteor shower. It's uh, 55 meteors per hour. Keep in mind that zenithal hourly rate is an ideal rate. You probably won't see 55 meteors per hour from any actual location. That's what the, the amount of meteors you would see if the zenith was directly overhead, you had perfectly dark skies, and the meteor shower was at its peak, which nobody has that kind of optimal condition. So you, you'll probably see one every you know five or six minutes. This comes from the constellation Aquarius. That's why they call them the Aquarius. So that's about the same, I'm trying to think, as like a good Perseids shower. Yeah, this meteor shower seems to be on a 12-year 12, uh, peak. I don't know why this one isn't as well known as the Perseids. It seems like in uh, 2009 it had an outburst of about 100 per hour. And we're on that 12-year cycle where it's getting weaker, but 55 to 60 per hour is still pretty respectable. And this is one of the very few that the Southern Hemisphere can join in on, too. Uh, for some reason, they don't quite understand. Most of the major showers, the radiants are in the northern hemisphere. I've never seen a, a reason or if that's just coincidence. But. And what's the source of this one? This one is Comet Halley. The this Comet is Halley, Halley. okay, yes. right. And this is an interesting, it's interesting you bring that up because Comet Halley is also a source of the Orionids in October, too. It's one of the very few comets that we get two meteor showers from. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, I th maybe, I don't know, like the Perseids are the, I think, the most famous one just because it's so nice and warm in the northern it's, hemisphere. It's the right time, yeah. During the Perseids, so it's great to go outside and I everyone's in their main, sleeping bags and you yeah. look up the sky. And and it's it's weird, the, the Lyrids a few weeks ago made a lot of news and they weren't really that uh, spectacular. It's strange how the news cycle and the media cycle goes with meteor showers, how they... They uh, they just get picked up by the right sources and everybody starts talking about them. But this one is uh, probably better and it's not really being talked about that much. So can you give people some like just general advice on if they want to enjoy a nice meteor shower? What they what should they do? Uh, watch in the morning. In the morning you're going to see more meteors. I always liken it when I'm telling people at star parties that think of a car driving down the highway. You get more bugs and mosquitoes on the front windshield than you get on the back. The Earth, after midnight, is facing forward in its orbit, so it's plowing into the meteor stream. Uh, you'll see a few in the evening, but you'll notice evening meteors, they have to catch up to the Earth because they're hitting the back windshield. So they can still do it, but you get those long, slow trains before local midnight, and then after local midnight, you start getting those head-on meteors where they're coming in. This meteor shower actually has a very fast velocity, too. It's uh, 66 kilometers per second, I believe. One of the faster meteor showers, so you're going to see a lot of fast, quick, uh, meteors and fireballs. That's great. Um, all right. Uh, well, we're going to move on then. Uh, so, Alan, you had a story this week about the test of the X-51, I think, like, just today, right? 
Oh yeah, well it happened on May 1st, Wednesday, but uh, the Pentagon didn't really release the full details about it until today. Uh, Aviation Week had a little bit on it uh, yesterday. Uh, so this is the last test of the X-51A. It's a hypersonic aircraft. Uh, it's designed to go above Mach 5 and it, uh, it's been a $300 million uh, nine-year uh, development program and uh, they have four X-51As that they've tested. This is the last one. Uh, the first three, you know, the first one did okay, the second one didn't do so well, the third one was just terrible, uh, that there was a, a fin that came loose and the, the vehicle was lost. Uh, less than a minute after it was launched and so they had to investigate that for months to find out what happened but uh, today it went off just fine and everything was went by the book they had a flight of about six minutes or so what with this uh, with this test vehicle what you do is that you put it basically on so, uh, solid rocket booster kind of like a cruise missile you fire it from a b-52 uh, it gets to maybe Mach 4.8 and then this little it, it looks like uh, Gosh, uh, someone, it, it's called the Wave Rider, and then one of my friends on Twitter said, hey, it should look like a surfboard if you're going to call it the Wave Rider, and it really does look sort of like Kinda a surfboard. Does. It, it's very, very aerodynamic, and what happens is that uh, it, it, you, you light it up, and you've got kind of this, uh, the atmosphere going through the uh, ramjet at the supersonic speeds, and so they've compared it to igniting a match in a hurricane, and, but uh, it worked, and uh, when it, like I say, Mach 5 uh, and uh, splashed into the Pacific Ocean when the test was done. So uh, a lot of people talk about how, oh, this is going to lead to hypersonic airplanes. We're going to be able to go from New York to London in an hour. And, you know, maybe this technology will uh, lead to those sorts of civilian applications. But why the military is doing this is so that they have hypersonic, super fast cruise missiles, and so that's where Great. you're going to see this technology uh, applied first. In fact, they, they already have a program at the Air Force Research Laboratory to, to work on hypersonic uh, weapons, and so the next generation of Star Wars uh, is a little bit closer because of this week's test. Now, Alan, Alan, from what I understand, uh, now I'm no aerodynamicist or anything like that. Neither am I. One of the really uh, difficult parts of achieving those hypersonic speeds, it's not just to go a little faster, a little faster, a little faster. It's that the, the getting the fuel to go through the engines at that, at that speed uh, starts to get really crazy once you reach a, a kind of a certain threshold and it starts doing all sorts of, uh, so all sorts of tricky things. And that's kind of what, they, what they're trying to uh, uh, accomplish with these new engines, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, as I said, uh, you're already having this uh, cruise missile, basically, that's going supersonic, and the engine won't work unless you get up to those hypersonic speeds. And so there's a lot of tricky aerodynamics that, that go into how uh, the scramjet works. It's uh, Scramjet is short for supersonic combustion ramjet. So it's a technology that a lot of people have been working on. Uh, they've been able to do it with hydrogen-based fuel, but this particular project used a hydro hydrocarbon fuel, a jet fuel that's a little more stable, and so they think that this is more the way to go than a hydrogen-based system. So a lot of the aerodynamics geeks really get into this. I, I just have to kind of <laughs> follow where they lead. Well, you get a couple of advantages, if I understand. One is the speed, <clears throat> and the other advantage is this: you don't need to carry your oxidizer in the way that you do with regular fuel, oh, because yeah. you're mm -hmm. because you're you're essentially taking the air right. and you're hitting it so fast that you're pressurizing the air as it's flowing through the engine, and then you're able to then mix it with your fuel. And so you don't, you know, when you typically carry jet fuel, you're carrying both the fuel and you're having to, you know, have to carry additional weight. So you're going to get all these additional advantages if you can cross that that speed. But but boy, you know, eventually what, Mach 20? I mean, I, I don't think that'll ever be really that comfortable as a passenger <laughs> ride, you know? Well, you... this is what they thought was going to happen with the X-15 in the 
the 50s, and it, it didn't. So I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't happen now. <laughs> but it's, right. You know, mm -hmm. Supersonic, tiny comfortable than tiny a 12-hour flight? flight? Um, That's the question. I, I think I would still probably choose the 12-hour flight over the, yeah, uh, the one-hour yeah. ballistic trajectory one hour, at one hour. Mach 20. Yeah. I, I think it's it's going to be a long time before you see this carrying people. I think one of the other applications they've talked about is uh, delivery, whether you're delivering a bomb or whether you're delivering delivering super duper Federal Express. That that's a possibility. That that's if you really absolutely need to have it over there in an hour. Yeah. I guess you could use this. I see Amazon putting money into this. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, obviously, from from a war perspective, right? The current situation is is that. You know, if the Americans detect the Russians having launched a bunch of nuclear missiles at them, they can launch a bunch back. So you get this this kind of balance of power. But if you get these these man, what an awful thing, scramjet nuclear missiles, then you, there's really no warning. You just like you press a button, and 45 minutes later, the other side of the earth explodes. There's no way to sort of to to have that defense against it. So I think that's why they want it, and it's you know. Awful, yeah, but, yeah. So, uh -huh. so I would, you know, I would much rather have it being delivering strawberries halfway across the earth in an hour. You know, fresh picked strawberries. Let's work on that. Fraser. In an hour, in forty-five minutes, yeah. The, the at, strawberry scram scramberries. As a yeah, exactly. <laughs> as opposed to you know nuclear missiles with no defense. Yeah. I think that's sort of that's the final end game of this. So, ugh. if um, nothing else, strawberry scramjet would be a great band name. <laughs> I dig it. Yeah. Um. All right, so we're going to move on. Uh, Amy, you've got a story about exoplanet habitability. Right. Um, so kind of an interesting uh, paper came out, I think yesterday it was published, um, urging, uh, what was her, what was this, sorry, I'm just going to look up the scientist's name. Apologize. Sarah Seeger. Um, Sarah, Sarah Seeger from MIT is calling for exoplanet researchers to broaden their view of habitable life in searching for exoplanet life forms. So the idea in the whole sort of search for exoplanets thing is that we're always kind of looking for Earth-like things, right? We're always like, we, we know the life that we have on Earth. We know the things that it takes to have life on Earth. So let's look for that elsewhere because that makes sense. But she's saying that there are so many different types of exoplanets that there are between you know, seven or eight hundred exoplanets have already been identified. A fraction of like a handful of those are possibly Earth-like, that there's such variety in the types of exoplanets that we're seeing, we should start to vary our definition of, of life-bearing characteristics and, and types of life forms to include all of these different kinds of exoplanets. So I'm sort of not surprised that this news has come out, and um, it's kind of interesting that a lot of people I'm seeing are sort of saying that it's absolutely crazy to be looking for non-Earth-like, or for, to be looking for life on non-Earth-like planets, but I mean, I would think that the existence of life around the hydrothermal vents on Earth is proof enough that you can find life in these extreme environments, like on rogue planets, just kind of wandering alone. If they have some kind of inner heat source, why not? Um, I mean, there's all kinds of different what forms that some kind of life could take, and I'm not a biochemist, so, you know, I won't say but that it could but, be non-carbon based, but it could, theoretically, right? But I mean, I in addition to just, like, life that could live in the extreme environments here on Earth, there's also, you know, there was an astrobiology report out a couple of years ago from NASA talking about that life could use different kinds of solvent than just water, so instead of yeah. using water as the basis of its life, you could imagine extreme forms of life that use, you know, liquid ammonia, uh, liquid methane, methane, things like that as yeah. the solvent for, for the life, and that really expands out the yeah. the kinds of, that of life forms that you can really have. Really changes the the so-called Goldilocks zone because we yeah. always look for the Goldilocks zone, right? Where where liquid water can exist on the planet's surface, but taking other elements that could exist in the liquid form and could possibly support life would just massively expand the habitable zone. And if we could figure out what to look for, and sort of how how to figure out where you know what life, what signs of life there would be on those extreme alien environments, we could maybe find something easier or sooner, and especially like the Earth-like planets are the small ones that are really hard to find. The Jupiter-sized planets, like we can see those easier. We have a higher chance of maybe finding something good in there, so um, well, what I'm if not those surprised. Jupiter planets have moons, you know, those, <laughs> yeah. you know, the we're looking at the solar system really hard. And moons around those gas giants, so yeah. why not somewhere else? A lot of talk yeah. about that, yeah, exomoons. 
Yeah. But, uh, but, but by what method, moon, though, right? Yeah. By what method would we search for life around these other these other planets? Because, you know, we really, I mean, the only real feasible way, apart from listening to radio signals from them, right? The only real feasible way to detect life around another planet is to examine the atmosphere of that planet from afar, look for some kind of gas in the atmosphere yeah. that, you know, could only be the product of either an advanced civilization or life, like, you know, oxygen in the atmosphere or pollution in the atmosphere. But there's saw, no telescope that can do that right now. Yeah. If we saw, so, like, the spectra of chlorophyll, for example, that would be something that we only know life can produce here. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I mean, I've I've been ranting about this for years, especially since they canceled the Terrestrial Planet Finder, right? This was the mission that would follow up on the James Webb that would be able to do the, exactly this thing. It would it would be able to detect the atmospheres, study the atmospheres of exoplanets and be able to actually tell you whether or not there was life there. It would like you would be able to look at some of these planets and be able to say, "Yeah, there's a good that, that's a good candidate for life." So, you know, I mean, I think it's great to expand the classifications for what's possible, but if there's no mission that will actually help us know what's possible, yeah. what's out there for real, then I don't know. It's like, I mean, it's it's good. I think it's it's good to sort of take take us out of this very narrow focus of looking for us in the universe when we're like we're pretty rare, even on Earth. There's you know way more microbes than people. We should be looking for the microbes. Um, but yeah, I'm not totally sure what's going to come of it. So. It'll be interesting. We have a hard enough time funding funding <laughs> planetary science in our own solar yeah. system. And, know, and um, I've seen a lot of people... Not, not to be solar system centric or anything, but... Uh, I mean, apparently you are. <laughs> the money, you know, we, we need to get the money to dig up... Uh, we need to dig up the money to go explore the places that we can actually go to right yeah. now. And, you know, never mind looking or figuring out if it's somewhere else. Yeah, I really think if we're going to start getting into this broader search for life, we've got to start with what we have access to, like Europa and Titan, and actually put more money into those, because we can do that within a lifetime, not 80 lifetimes. Well, what she's saying here is that even if you say we're going to use liquid water as an indicator of habitability, you have to assign a probability to the planet. It's not just in the Goldilocks zone, out of the Goldilocks zone. There are lots of things going on with the planet how it's working, how big it is, where it is in its orbit, how elliptical is the orbit, all these things. She actually is proposing more of like a triage or a pro probability assignment to how um, likely it is that these, you know, can have liquid water, not just based on that Goldilocks on hypothesis. And then pointing something like James Webb or something larger to look for these gases in the atmosphere. We just oh, need of... that observatory. We need that telescope right. to get yep. launched. I, I'm always kind of skeptical when they say the latest Earth-like planet or super-Earth has been found, too, because I'll point out that from a distance, Venus would look like Earth if we put it in another solar system. But Venus is very yes. different than Earth. So. Yeah, and so would Mars. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. let's move on. So um, we need, like, a sad trombone noise for the wah, Herschel wah, shutdown. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. So, I'm sure so Nicole, uh, you've been uh, watching poor Herschel get shut down. Poor Herschel. But Herschel had a very successful mission. So Herschel is a, uh, a joint mission between NASA and ESA, so the European and, and American Space Agencies. It's an infrared telescope, which, which means it's looking at light that has a wavelength uh, longer than that of, um, of visible light. And so it sees certain things. It sees uh, warm dust. It could see forming planets. Um, and in order to look at infrared light, you have to cool your detectors, cool parts of the telescope down. I think they use liquid helium on this mission. And so as expected, the liquid helium eventually will run out. And as expected, it ran out right about the time it was supposed to. Um, and so now that it's run out of helium, they can't observe anymore because the noise on the detector is, is, is far too high. Basically, you know, if you have a telescope that sees warm things and the telescope itself is warm, it can't really see anything. It's like shining a flashlight down, you know, the, the barrel of your Cassegrain telescope. But I know with Spitzer, they did a, they did a cold mission and then they did a warmer mission as well. Right. Did they do that with Herschel? Herschel, uh, I don't think it's observing at wavelengths short enough to work in a warm mission. I think it's only using the mid-infrared wavelengths and those require the liquid, the liquid coolant. Um, so that's why they... Wise, they... Wise did that too, correct? They, they had like a, they did like a little, a, right. a little closer look. Yeah, so when the coolant runs out, you can still work in some frequencies, but or wavelengths, but not but not in others. And so I don't think Herschel was equipped with those detectors, which is why it's 
you know, can't be used anymore. But it did some really awesome stuff, uh, detecting uh, star-making material, detecting, uh, working with Spitzer to discover asteroid, the asteroid belt around the, the bright star Vega, um, and uh, looking at, at, at intense star formation in distant galaxies. So Herschel did awesome stuff, uh, but is at its at end of its expected lifetime. All right, so David, now I've heard that Comet Ison is going to destroy the Earth. Is this true? Sure, sure. <laughs> no. wait, wait, what? No, wait. No, oh, it's, it's a conspiracy. Uh, it, it seems to be the latest thing going around the web, and I didn't realize this till Nancy shot it to me that I guess they're, they're winding up already pretty early on Comet Ison. Uh, and it seems like they're just recycling a lot of the hail bop type stuff too, where they're talking about there was a video that went around of that an amateur took of uh, an animation, a GIF animation he did of Comet Ison, and, and they're claiming they're seeing objects moving behind it. Oh, now, now not that when again. I know it's the same. It's like hail bop redux kind of. Yeah, at Comet Elenin. I mean, we just see that it. It was really bad. Yeah. Again and again. You know, that whenever really somebody, bad. whenever somebody sends me a video of something being, I'm a fairly advanced observer. I usually, before I read any comments or any kind of theories on it, I go and just give it my own look at and think, what do I think it is? Then I start reading the comment and see how many people agree with me. <laughs> it's uh, This one almost certainly is uh, what they call hot pixels in the camera. And you can see it in the animation because these are GIFs and they're just individual still shot frames. You can actually see, well, they're saying, well, it's moving with it, but it's like, yeah, it's the camera tracking the comet, not the other way around. It's, it's actually hot pixels, not cosmic ray hit pixels, but it's just some kind of defects in the camera. My camera has, my DSLR has a few little pixels I usually have to erase out. That's common with detectors. So it's, now, uh, now, now, Alan, you have been reporting on this stuff longer than I think anybody I know, and how many times have you debunked you know, object in space is, you know, planet X and going to destroy us all. Well, I got to say that Ian O'Neill has been doing, has been doing a great job and Phil Plate. Mm -hmm. uh, and yep. there are, there are all They're sorts of uh, people who are not, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we, we all do this. Uh, I know we all do. That's, that's part of the job. And so David did a great job uh, with Comet Ison and there has been Comet Elenin and, Actually, I, I did cover Comet Hale Bop and, and talked with yes. one of the guys who was part of that suicide cult but missed the appointment. And okay. uh, wow. unfortunately, uh, he, he uh, took his own life uh, later, just couldn't cope with this, this whole crazy thing. So, uh, and uh, you've got <clears throat> 2012, that, that's, uh, that's a huge thing, and, and the Large Hadron Collider. But it's serious stuff. We laugh at it, but uh, there have been people who have done kind of desperate things because they took it seriously, and so mm -hmm. we got to yeah. continue with this. Well, we did a whole series on the 2012. Actually, I originally yeah. assigned all those 2012 stories to to Ian O'Neill, mm -hmm. and it's, that's how he got into this whole as a career. Um, and uh, and but I mean, we just got so many emails. Like we were just getting email after email from, and in some cases, they were really heartbreaking stuff. I mean, we would get emails from from children, from teenagers saying, "I'm so scared. Am I going to die?" Uh, you know, oh, because yeah. of 2012, and you just kind of go, no, no, everything's fine, and then look <laughs> at this really important article that we've written that really debunks everything, and yet they just, they keep coming back. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the the people who are, are, who are digging up these these stories, it's just like clockwork. Like, you see a new comment, and like I knew, you know, we could have... Come up. What's that? Yeah. How they, get Dave, uh, they get Dave Yeoman to, to come in. He knows everything about, you know, everything that's flying around the, the, uh, uh, the near-Earth area. Um, uh, David Morrison, um, you know, comes in. He talks about stuff. And, and still there are those who will say, no, those guys are liars. And they will, yeah. play, they, will, they will come right out and say, those guys are liars. Here's the truth. And so you, you can understand where people who don't follow science and astronomy uh, as part of their daily life, they don't understand. They, they go, well, who's right? Who's yeah. right? Who should, I, who should I trust? That's so a that's, default that's, position yeah, that they go back to. Like I was telling you, it's like a, we, we were already called a, a shill for NASA basically this past year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was hoping that 2012 would have been such a public no. mistake. 
No. That, you know, so many people were expecting the end of the world in 2012, and it just didn't happen. It's just business as usual. That that would give people a tiny little bit, like a oh. vaccination against I, against I, those conspiracy that's theories. That's a bad word, considering we, that there are vaccination conspiracies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. But I still, you know, <laughs> just like a, well, like, you know, you said the world was going to end in 2012, and nothing happened. So now we're a little numb to this. Do you have it? But but look look. There's a Wikipedia page on a list of dates predicted for apocalyptic events. This yeah. page mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not new. People predicting the end of the world. Oh yeah. Almost, I mean, almost just, every every bright no, comet but, has had its. Uh, but 2012 been... was the Gangnam Style of <laughs> media, right? <laughs> Right of of apocalypse. So so in other words, like you know, if you think about like what is the piece of media that has been seen by more human beings, it is Gangnam Style. We have you know we have all seen it, and you know more, more than any you know more than Shakespeare, more than anything. And so, 2012 was so well publicized, nope, it, you know, enough. leading up to 2012, that I really feel like it you know it really kind of passed through almost everybody's brains. Hit Frankly, I, I think I think it did have an effect. I, I, you know, you're always going to have, every generation has a doomsday date. Uh, yes. Y2K, you go back to the great disappointment of 1847 or so. Uh, so you're always going to have this, but the, these events, these big events do have an effect on that generation. Now, mm -hmm. in, in the next generation, there will be another big doomsday event, no, no doubt. But uh, I feel like after 2012, it hasn't been as played up uh, as, you know, it, it was before. And I think actually the rapture, if you remember the rapture, I think that had an effect as well. I think people saw that there were a lot of people who took it very seriously and then nothing happened. And so they know that this is how the event is going to go down. You remember the uh, the Jupiter effect in the 80s, the 1980s, was uh, Jupiter was supposed to pull us up our axis? Or... Right, and, right, and the grand convergence, you, yeah. you know, you, you get these things every couple of years. Age of Aquarius. Uh, GeForce833 asks, so how long until someone claims that Comet Icing is actually the planet Nibiru? Uh, it's already, already happened. Been done. It's done. Yeah. 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 In fact, that is the Check. story that David worked on Negative on Universe Today. Days. Yeah. <laughs> what do you... I've, I've had people ask me on Google Earth, when you go on Google Sky, it's like that, that why are their areas blacked out on Google Sky? It's like, what's NASA hiding if you can't? It's like, you know, so there, there's error, there's in, entries in the data that has gaps. I mean, there are amateurs out there scanning the skies every night with massive telescopes. I mean, we, we couldn't hide something like that. There would be no way that yeah. you could hide something Tom like that. Tom Nath adds, a brief history of the apocalypse goes back nearly 4,000 years. <laughs> as long as there's been a world, someone's been predicting the yeah. end. All right, so, but let's get to some real science, uh, which is, uh, Matthew, you've been, you wrote a post about uh, antimatter, anti-gravity. Yeah, so this is, a, uh, this is a really cool story, but unfortunately, we're only in. I, we're not even in the first chapter. We're kind of in yeah. the prologue to the story. I should have um, like air quoted real, real yeah. science. Yeah, um, speculative but it's, science. But it, it, it's really interesting. Um, it's the idea which has uh, has been uh, floated, haha, a few, a few times that antimatter, which you know every type of particle has a, a kind of a mirror image version has opposite electrical charge. But there's the idea that maybe it also has the opposite gravitational effect. So in other words, if you had a, if you could somehow construct a weight out of antimatter, it would fall up instead of down. Now, the, the thing is, it's really hard to make that much antimatter in one place. We have a lot of trouble making even individual anti-hydrogen atoms. Um, and that's the lightest element that there can be. And so it is actually not, uh, it's, it's actually remarkably hard to test the gravitational effects of, on antimatter. Um, and, but uh, researchers working with the alpha experiment in, at CERN, um, despite the fact that it's all capitalized, I don't believe it's an acronym. I haven't found a description of it, but it's it's called alpha, and it's an anti-hydrogen trap. What they do is they cool down antimatter particles and then entice them into forming uh, anti-hydrogen atoms for a variety of experiments. And they figured out that hey, as these anti-hydrogen uh, atoms 
escape from the trap, maybe we can see whether they preferentially go up or down. And so far, all they have is the data that's already been collected. So they weren't doing a specific experiment on the antihydrogen. They're just seeing whether the existing data um, shows falling up or falling down. And, or, and even more to the point, whether uh, the mass of the antihydrogen, the gravitational mass, the, the, the force of gravity acting on it, is the same as the inertial mass, how hard it is to steer an antimatter particle. So that's what's called the equivalence principle. Um, we know that pretty well from for matter, but for antimatter, it's really hard to test. So sort of two things in one. But the preliminary results are completely and utterly inconclusive, can't tell a thing. But that doesn't mean that in the future, with knowing what we're looking for, we couldn't go and design specific experiments to do this. And so that's really what this, what this uh, experiment, the value of this experiment is. What would be the implications if it does fall up and not down? Well, that is a really interesting thing because there's a lot more matter than there is antimatter in the universe. But with enough of this antimatter around, if it did have antigravity, then it could possibly help explain stuff like why the expansion of the universe is accelerating. It could have something to do with dark energy, possibly. And again, that's not a given. Even if it falls up, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to solve all the problems we have with cosmology. But wouldn't you also get the situation where, the, I guess, the antimatter is, is being repelled by gravitational objects? You're not seeing the annihilation, so it would help sort of explain maybe where it's hidden? Possibly. Um, but you know, again, that's, that's a question of how much, you know, how... how Gravity is the weakest force in the universe, so a lot of other things are going to affect it before gravity is going to be the primary thing. It's going to, if it has anti-gravity, it's going to tend to be most important on the biggest scales, the biggest objects, and on on the scale of the universe as a whole. So um, it won't tend to make as much difference on as far. Again, as this is this is as far as I can tell. Um, other people may be able to chime in, but it's not going to make as, as big a difference, say, on the scale of the Milky Way. But we could build spaceships out of antimatter and then just release them like balloons, and they would just float off into space, right? Yeah, if you if you could figure out how to, you, 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 yeah, you you want to get it, you want to, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't fly in the spaceship. It would, um, it would repel no, you. No, no, it would just be like a balloon. It would be a balloon uh, at the top of the spaceship. You, you, you just would can't like, touch your spaceship. Yeah, you don't touch your spaceship. You hold a big yeah. balloon, and then you hold it in some kind of magnetic field, and you attach your spaceship to it, and then you just off into space. Oh, like well, given we have, not to, we have yet <laughs> to make a feasible. single gram of antimatter. We have yet to make a single tiny gram of antimatter. You, you have good luck with that phrase. I just, I just I have a Fraser. bountiful imagination. Yes. All right, let's move on. Um, okay, so, and this is cool uh, for uh, those of us Canadians here in this, uh, Blame Canada. In this episode, uh, which is that they put space robots on the $5 Canadian bill. And I don't have one yet, but... They're not oh, in circulation until November. Not, no? Okay. No. But have you got a picture? Alan, you report on this, right? There's a... Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, or Amy did, but... I posted sure. it. Go for it. Yeah, go for it, Amy. It's pretty cool. Um, sorry, I wasn't prepared. Shall we sing O Canada while we're waiting? Blame <laughs> But, Here, but go, if, go I guess if people, if people don't figure. know, the Canadians' sort of uh, contribution to space exploration is that we built the, the Canada arm for the space shuttle, and we built the, uh, the sort of robot arm version to, on, the, uh, on the International Space Station. There's your and arm. We and it's being, our money. It's being do, celebrated. Do U.S. has the worst okay. money ever. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. go. Did now, I screen now share? The, <laughs> now, the Canadian money, if you've never yeah, seen it, it's kind of neat. Um, <laughs> that part where it's white there is actually clear plastic, so you can actually see right through the money. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the whole oh. bill is actually very plasticky feeling to it. And I guess it's, it's chalk filled with holograms and... Um, Goodness. All kinds of other, and there's Braille. You can see up in the upper right corner there, there's Braille. There's a little bit of antimatter inside of A little bit of antimatter, <laughs> yeah. Just to Canadians prevent counterfeiting. Canadians figured out antimatter. Yeah. <laughs> we have too many Canadians in this hangout. 
You can never yeah, we, have too many Canadians. <laughs> okay, fair we, enough. Want, we want space on American money. We should um, have space. We want yeah, American space money. Money. Well, that's, well, that's a well, terrible irony. Well, there's an astronaut on the Ohio quarter. That's right. That's sure. right. And there is Benjamin Franklin is kind of a scientist, I guess. It's yeah. The closest and we have to a right scientist. Flyer. So we're we're starting to run out of time, but I got two yep. more stories that we We've wanted to quickly look at. We've got a couple of questions as well to get to. Um, oh, do you have, do you want to hit the questions? Sure. Uh, what was the first one I posted a while back? Uh, somebody was asking. Oh, I don't know where it, it went. A question for oh, Amy, Ollie Olson asked uh, if we find meteorite fragments, where I should we that. send them? If if they're talking about the Edo Pirates, yeah. If they find to be, if, if they ever come across a rock that seems, uh, okay. what do they do? Hmm. I, I don't know if that's related to the Edo Aquarius, but you won't find any fragments of that because they're yeah. Okay, but if you do, what, do, what <laughs> should you do if you think you have found a, I, a meteorite fragment? I, I would I would DM uh, Jeffrey Notkin at the Meteorite Men and say, hey, what do I do with this? Okay, Meteorite Men. A lot of them show up at universities. They, they come to yeah. the physics department or geology department. At universities and say, hey. It's pretty tough, if I understand right, that, you know, for it to be a stony meteorite, it looks a lot like a rock. Yes. And it's pretty tough to, to be able to distinguish between a rock and a meteorite. And it's hard to distinguish between an iron meteorite and iron slag from a factory <laughs> as well. That yeah. A lot of fake meteorites, or aka meteor wrongs, are, yeah. um, come from factories. Yeah. Uh, not the ones that uh, Phil Plate hands out, though. Those are or you. legit. Well, that's the one from Phil you Plate. legit? Yeah. No, yeah. no, yeah. no meteorites have ever been associated with a meteor shower. I learned that. Here's my Jeffrey. meteorite. <laughs> Um, nice. Oh, cool. Uh, Razor hands it out like candy. Um, <laughs> okay, so we got we got a cool picture of a bullet uh, a bullet hole in the ISS uh, solar array. Yes. Well, I'll just. I could put that pop, up. Pop it up. Oh, I, I dug it up. So it's oh, you got we it. actually we actually covered oh, this okay. in the uh, in our episode of Astronomy Cast. We talked about ISS and talked about the uh, about this hole, but yeah. Yeah, well, um, it was a, it was a couple of days ago, and um, Commander Chris Hadfield, uh, Can another Canadian uh, astronaut, he's the Expedition Thirty Five commander, and he tweeted this photo uh, of the solar arrays on the ISS, and you know, in one of them, you can see this little bright spot, which is basically you know, looking through where a micro, where a, I don't know if it was micro or not, where, where a meteoroid had punched through it, and there it is. Um, I'm going to shut mine off so it doesn't pop up, um, had punched through it and left a good-sized hole in there. Now, I'm not quite sure, and I've, I've looked to see if I could find what, how big those individual um, solar cells are. I'm not quite sure. Um, the only thing I found was that all in all, there's an acre of solar panels across the, um, the space station. But regardless, something hit that, and he, uh, uh, Chris Hadfield said, glad it missed the hull. I'm sure that you know that would that would have been a um, now I'm not I'm not quite sure if something that that size uh, would have done any major damage to the hull or if it would have just you know sunken into some of the many layers uh, that they have surrounding the uh, the, the inhabited sections. Um, regardless, it reminds you that there's stuff flying around up there all the time, and um, and I, I believe he also used the term uh, a bullet hole. And actually, if you think about it, whatever hit that was going much faster than any bullets fly here on Earth. Um, your average rifle bullet goes about one to 2,000 miles an hour. Um, usually they're measured in feet per second, but we're, you know, for the sake of argument here, it goes about one to 2,000 miles per hour. Out in orbit, um, well, meteorites are coming in, meteors are coming in at about 25,000 miles an hour. So, you know, and, and upwards of that. So, and even the space station itself is going, you know, 17, 5, uh, thousand miles an hour. So, you know, everything's going super fast up there. Um, whatever, whenever this happened, it would have just been an instantaneous event. I had a, uh, I had a picture up in, in one of our last Hangouts that showed um, <clears throat> a block of uh, aluminum yeah, with a gigantic that. crater dug out of it by a 9-gram object that was sort of fired at the, at the aluminum at the speed that these things move in space. I mean, it was catastrophic. It was a gigantic mm -hmm. amount of damage. Now, so, somebody suggested that this could have been a piece of um, space junk that's, in, that's, you know, in orbit, a little bit of uh, debris from, from who knows what, or it could have been something that came in uh, from somewhere else in the solar system. 
we really wouldn't know because everything out there is going really, really fast. But I think, you know, I mean, if this hit an astronaut, for example, it would be a bad day. Yeah. yeah this, this, would be, this would be not something you would want impacting you if you were out on EVA doing a little repair on the outside of the, uh, you know, on the outside of one of the units there. Yeah, and so I mean, this is just this is one of the risks that they're they're ready for. That you just your number might come up at some point, and these these bullets are are zipping past the space station all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, got one last sort of note notice for people, and I think David, you've got this, which is the upcoming annular solar eclipse. Yes, there is an annular solar eclipse next Friday, Thursday, Friday. It crosses the international dateline, going from Australia through the South Pacific. Uh, and it's going to end in the Eastern Pacific. It's going to cross the same path as the total solar eclipse we had over Australia last year. Well, it's going to crisscross that same path. And Hawaii is going to see it as a deep partial to about a 50% partial. So Hawaii will get some of North, the islands in the Pacific will get it as well. Will, will we get it here on the west coast of uh, no, North it America? No, it barely misses the west coast. The sun will set before it actually right. probably get any of the partial phases. The place to be would be just northwest of Ayers Rock in Australia, like Western Australia and the Northwest Territories would be the, the, the best place to, to catch it. It's an annular, so it's not going to be a total. So. Right. Just for people who aren't aware of the difference between an annular and a total solar eclipse? Oh, for an annular eclipse, the moon is actually out too far away to cover the sun. It's just barely, you're going to get like a bright ring around it. And I want to mention, too, that during an annular eclipse, you also have to take precautions to use these throughout the eclipse. Uh, either these are some kind of safe, approved uh, uh, protection, because unlike a total eclipse, when it's in totality, you can take your eclipse glasses off and look at that. But you have to actually protect yourself, because even though it's only about 5% of the sun, I've seen an annular from Lake Erie in 1994, and 5% of the sun is still really, really bright. It's about 20,000 times brighter than the full moon. So it's brighter than you would think. Um, just a show of hands, or who's seen a total solar eclipse? I have not. Believe it or not. Alan. No, neither Aww. have I. Only Alan. Yeah. Uh, 2017? 2017, 2017, we will all yeah. see one. Yeah, Party in St. Louis, guys. Everyone, come on. Hooray! <laughs> I'm thinking Columbia, South Carolina, maybe where Well, it, the spot where the 2017 eclipse and the 2024 eclipse, I think, cross. Illinois, like, yep. 30 miles from here. Yeah, so yeah, we're going right to try and observe both eclipses from the same spot. Right around Car Eastern Carbondale. Oregon is where I'm going to go for it. Yeah, Carbondale, Illinois. There's that sounds good, Fraser. Maybe, maybe I'll go with you. Yeah, How about we'll, that? yeah, we'll do that. We'll do a party there in Eastern Oregon. All right, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap this up then. So, uh, everybody, uh, Alan, where do we see more Alan Boyle? Well, right now it's cosmiclog.com. That's the easy way to put it. And on Twitter, I'm B0YLE. Remember the zero. Remember the zero. <laughs> Amy, share a title. Um, you can find my blog, Vintage Space. Just Google it or my website, amysharetitle.com. I'm also um, all around the social media, Discovery News, uh, Motherboard Device, Al Jazeera English, and Scientific American. You really are. You are the hardest working journalist. I'm paying my bills. <laughs> <laughs> David. I am currently a uh, routine contributor to Canada.com, ListaSore.com, UniverseToday.com, my own site, Astro Guys with a Z, and I have an article coming up in Sky and Telescope. Yay. Nice. <laughs> about what? Uh, it's going to be about social media and astronomy. I can I can release that. It's going to be out there, but we're going to have a bit about the virtual star party in there. Nice. Well, so. That's great. All right, Jason. Well, like it says down there, I'm at lightsinthedark.com. Uh, I'm also writing on Universe Today, uh, Discovery News Space, and you can find me on Twitter at JP Major. All right. Dr. Matthew Francis. You always say doctor. I guess it's because it's my Twitter handle. Um, are you or are you not a PhD astronomer, I am, astrophysicist? I, I, am a, I am a post, post hole digger, yes. I'm a PhD. Um, <laughs> Piled higher and deeper. That is, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm hardwired. Yes. So he's very I, good about, about I do, the doctor I do the thing. same I like for Nicole. I love yes, it. This is true. Uh, you can find me at Bowler Hat Science, Galileo's Pendulum. Uh, those are both .org, by the way. And uh, right for... Uh, of uh, Ars Technica, BBC Future, and now New Yorker. Nice. All right. And Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Hi. I work for CosmoQuest, 
podcast. Uh, I'm the postdoc there, and I write for Discovery and Skeptic and School of Doubt, which is an education blog, and uh, I can't remember what else. Probably just mine, noisyastronomer.com. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, and so the next thing we're doing, I guess, is going to be the Virtual Star Party, which is going to be on Sunday night, where you join me and Scott Lewis and a whole bunch of astronomers. We're going to give you a live view of the night sky with whatever whatever is up, with whatever telescopes we can wrangle together. So join us on Sunday night when it gets dark on the West Coast, which is about 8.30 Pacific Standard Time or so. Oh, I have an announcement as well. CosmoQuest classes. Uh, I know Matthew is teaching a cosmology class right now, but coming up soon we have a class on the sun and stellar evolution. That'll be taught by Ray Sanders. So if you go to cosmoquest.org slash classes, that'll give you the information there, and you can sign up for that class. Awesome. Starting All soon. Right. Yes. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. This is a action-packed episode, so we'll, uh, we'll see you all next week. Ooh.